This is a question all about hypothetical scenarios. And hypothetical scenarios are, of course, very, very useful to the writer, particularly to writers of things like tech thrillers, writers of science fiction, but also anyone who wants to write something that is based largely on something that they have imagined. It's based largely on a concept. I think that it's a very valuable exercise for a writer to come up with a simple sounding scenario and then come up with a detailed treatment of it that is feasible, believable, and that an average reader will accept. So this is an example of that. It's a little bit longer, and so I'm probably going to fall over my words quite a lot, so there'll probably be a lot of jump cutting. <laughs> I shall try to stay still. Uh, and so here we go. I'm going to read the, uh, the title directly off here because I don't want to get this wrong. I have an army of a hundred men with machine guns, one tank, one military helicopter. Could I conquer the ancient world in 100 BC using this technology? Plenty of storytellers come up with scenarios that have never and will never happen. However, it is possible to find real events that can be compared and, in the small details, find parts of the scenario and the writer can use these to refine their idea and to discover whether it's feasible and whether it can be turned into a story. In this case, I started thinking about historical events like the arrival of Cortes in South America or the Battle of Rourke's Drift, uh, among others, and I concluded as follows. You could conquer much of the ancient world, but you'd have to get your paradigm exactly right. Other people are quick to point out, with this kind of scenario, that it's unlikely that you would succeed if you attempted military conquest. And if you did succeed with a military conquest, you wouldn't keep what you conquered for very long, mostly for reasons of logistics and sheer weight of numbers. But if you start thinking outside mere military might, you might start finding the solutions. The first thing that occurred to me was the idea of, OK, maybe you could use your power to gain influence, to actually get some allies among the, uh, the population in the ancient world. This, I thought, is only going to be halfway to success. Other people will quite often suggest in a situation like this, well, why don't you just use that technology to convince people that you're a god? My feeling about that is that it's unnecessary and the risks are possibly too big to take. However, something resembling those two, that's a little bit more moderate, a little bit easier to accept, and certainly something that more people can do, is politics. Select, I suggest, an existing empire. Perhaps not the biggest one around, but one of the major contenders. There are reasons for this I'll come to later on. To begin with, you'll need an interpreter, and you'll need to recruit a network of local spies and informants. This, I think, will be fairly easy, as you'd easily be able to set yourself up not as a god, but as a golden goose. The ease with which you would be able to re relieve people of their valuables would convince them that by working for you, they could become as rich as gods and in pretty short order. And as a result, many, many people would be happy to give you their loyalty in return for the power that you'd be able to give them later on. That is just human nature. So, once you have your network in place, you use them to discover who are the key players in the existing power structure. Most ancient empires were massive hi 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 I knew I was going to follow my words. Most ancient empires were massive hierarchies with a super elite class at the top, just below the supreme and godlike head of state, who in some cases was even a pampered and powerless figurehead. 
That super elite class is where your biggest allies need to be. Not the ones who are right at the top, though. What you're looking at, what you're looking for, is ambitious people. People who know that if they can get the right allies for themselves, they will be able to take the place of the people at the top. Once you've identified them, you have to make opportunities to demonstrate your power to them. In exactly the same way as everyone else that you've recruited so far, except that they, because they're already playing the game of politics, will recognise the possibilities beyond your ability merely to make them suddenly very rich. The less imaginative of them will see that you could be an unstoppable way to remove their political enemies, both at home and abroad. The really smart ones will see that they can use you exactly as you intend to use them. Those are the ones that are going to give you all the information you need to stage a coup d'etat. They are also the ones that you'll have to get rid of in pretty short order once the coup d'etat is completed. Because you will have placed yourself directly in the super elite. And you'll have acquired legitimacy through your allies in the super elite. And you can take over the entire state with very limited bloodshed. And this is even better because it means you can use your technological superiority sparingly. This will have the dual effect of making it seem all the more powerful and limiting how much the smart people around you will be able to work out and learn about the limitations of your technology. You will have to be opportunistic and ruthless. You will have to trust the least trustworthy of people. You will have to be ready to rid yourself of them as soon as they have served your purpose. Because that is exactly what they will be intending to do to you. If you succeed, you will also have to win over the upper classes and the priest class, but this is easier to do. All you have to do is show the upper classes that you have no intention of changing anything in the established social order. Win a couple of military campaigns and they'll support you willingly. The priests just have to be reassured that you will keep them fat and that you will keep them powerful. Make a show of persecuting a few heathens, donate the confiscated goods of the heathens to a few temples, and you should be settled. The next step is to begin expanding your empire. This can be done because your newly acquired ancient armies know that there is a small but unstoppable force at the top of their military hierarchy. They will assume, rather than hope, that they will win all their battles. Use yet more politics and propaganda to spread the belief that resisting conquest by your empire results in sudden, public and dare I say, explosive death of people in positions of power and prominence. And smaller states will soon, soon start offering you tribute and accepting you as overlord. As you can see, the whole principle here is one of enabling talented locals to do what they already know how to do. Using your superiority strategically by using it as little as possible, but to maximum effect. Building reputation, earning loyalty, ensuring that you are both admired and feared. Making sure that you are more useful to the locals alive than dead. In short, you have to become their pet dragon. In a decade or so, if all goes well, they won't want it any other way, and you'll still have 99% of your ammunition. 